I'm calling it right now. Today's guest is the best ref in the area. Joining me now, it's Jeff Risk. He's been around Minot since the groovy 70s. We're going to get into a lot of recreation stuff. Refing, Mondak League, Nedros Cardinals, and some great food that we've had while hanging out. Jeff, first of all, if you look back over your career in sports, what has been some of like the high points of refing for you? And then tell me first initially, like, why you wanted to get into the recreation sphere and get a degree in that area? Well, getting a rec degree, I I came and I started out as a music major, actually. I played in a band um, during high school, early college, and so that was my goal. And then once I got here, all my friends were done with school at 1 o'clock, and I was still going in all these groups, practicing until late night. So I switched to Fayette, and then kind of along with Fayette, they encouraged you to get a recreation degree at that time because it was very few extra classes to it. And so that ended up being the route that I took in that regard. Were you a singer or a player with your music aspirations? <laughs> I was. I played saxophone. Oh, man. Um, I did, I did and, alto saxophone through high school and college. That's awesome, man. So with regard to that, uh, what are your favorite 1970s hits? Because you've been in Minot since 75. Well, I mean, I listened to the There wasn't a lot else other than listening to the radio at the time. But I played in a kind of a funk band, a club band that we did a lot of Tower of Power, uh, Cold Blood, Average White Band. Um, so those were kind of anything with brass hooked to it kind of ended up you know, being favorites of mine. There you go. So, Minot since 75, that's, oh, what? I'm doing the math. 45 years, dude. How has this been the right place for you in, after all this time? Well, it, I didn't really know much about Minot. Obviously, I just came to college here because they had a good music department. Mm -hmm. And uh, you end up making friends, got involved with the Sigtoff fraternity. And um, it kind of expanded from there. And then I got into professional baseball while I was still in college as an umpire. And I would come back and uh, both Gary Cedarstrom and I, we would sub every day in the Minot system when we were back. And then we'd referee ball games at night. And it just kind of got to be a routine. And, you know, once you have a lot of, your friends and et cetera established it, it kind of became the stay. Mm -hmm. So great to see the staying power of the music program here to get Jeff risk a little interested. And then even to have Micah Holman come out to this day, guys like that. So let's talk repping. Obviously you've done it for a long time. How do you become a good one? Well, I think you have to, uh, you have to study. Always, a lot of these, when I, I still run camps and that for officials and supervise some leagues. And when people ask me about plays, I always say, well, what are you basing your call on? And a lot of people can't do that very well. They don't know. They just say, well, it looked like a foul or it looked like this. I said, well, it becomes a lot easier. I said, you're going to be 50-50 on those plays if that's your philosophy on close plays. So in order to get better, you've got to study rules, number one, and learn. Then you have to learn how to apply black and white rules to a gray game. And that's where the skill level comes. Some people can be successful at, you know, working girls basketball. Some people can be work, uh, successful working college basketball. And you've got to find your niche in there and then you've got to keep your ears open you got to listen to coaches and if you're hearing the same thing night after night it's something i've got to fix if it's random you're probably doing all right mm -hmm. and then you try to build a catalog you're building catalogs of plays what was not a good play what was a good play so that when you see those plays again they don't surprise you because your judgment is pretty good if things don't surprise you, if, if you've seen plays like that before. 
Um, so it's a, it's a combination of study and application. And then you've got to learn, you develop a philosophy of the game. I worked in the CBA for a while, and we had a, the IBA for a lot of years, and those were really good players, fun to work. Uh, but you had to, if you didn't adjust your game to the height and speed, uh, you stuck out. And so that was a good chance to practice, and I think it made working some of the lower levels a little easier. I was recently talking with Andy Latch about baseball. We were mentioning how offensively you are fantastic if you're batting 350, succeeding 35% of the time, and you kind of brought up with the close plays. Is that kind of optimum refereeing where it's like you're not noticed because referees blend in, you can't see that they're missing a ton, and the really close ones, 50-50 is really like the – what you can feel good about basically and like the really tight stuff. Cause I mean, like they review NFL calls all the time and it, the prevailing thing is like just to get it right by that final step. But do you think that's just kind of, kind of the good metric that you want to see with officiating at this level? Well, you, well, number one, you don't want to make the same mistake over and over. Mm-hmm. Um, if you do that, then you're obviously less become less desirable. Your goal is to improve. I compare it to like when I was in rookie league baseball versus A, double A, triple A. When you go like that, each level you're allowed less mistakes before and you've got to improve and, and do things at a higher level. The players play better, the umps, the officials work better, the coaches coach better. And you that's the same thing when you bring that out into any other sport. You may, you're allowed to make more mistakes at the Class B level than you are at the Class A level and still be accepted. And then you move into college, and it, it keeps narrowing down, and it's whether or not your ability, you know, can match the play. Mm-hmm. And then you've got to be kind of the better people in your area. Um, you know, if you're in an area with a lot of good referees, the nice thing is you get to be around them and you'll learn from them. How the do down thing is it takes, you know, it's harder to get involved if there's more good guys ahead of you. Yeah, because, like, how do you tend to move up traditionally, like you yourself and, like, guys that you've seen? And ultimately, tell me a little bit about, like, the biggest games that you've been a part of. Um, well, you move up by it, – it's, it's changed throughout the years. It used to be coaches called you. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't, you didn't even in colleges. You, you coach or the AD would call you, and and you'd go work. Um, now we have assigners in at most every level, and so it is easier to get involved as far as getting started because there's plenty of games, especially since they put girls and boys basketball together. Mm-hmm. There's been. Um, There's almost more games than referees. So you're going to get a chance to work. Then are you going to go out and put the time in and do you have enough inner pride to make you want to get better or are you just refing for a check? And and if you, don't say, if you learn to referee, people will find you. And now we have all kinds of camps to go to um, where, like, Myself as supervising college leagues and that, um, we're going to find you. I also have duties with the high school activities and uh, at all the state tournaments and football playoffs and things. So you're out there kind of learning who's available to work and who does well. And then when you talk to them, I always look to see do they understand the game at all? You know, and that's if they have some of those things or they're good listeners, then they're going to get a chance. As far as officiating, I, I really enjoyed the IBA, which was a league they had um, a team in Minot, Bismarck, Fargo, Winnipeg had a team, uh, Sioux Falls, and a couple others a little further out, Des Moines, I guess. And I worked the finals in that league, uh, at least three times, maybe more. Probably worked worked a lot of 
DAC-10 finals, which were always fun games. Um, work, NDSU UND was a was a good game, fun game to work at the time. Worked it in Hislop, and uh, and then in I've also worked some national tournaments in the NEIA and the JUCO level. Um, went to Hutchinson two years and did a couple NEIA tournaments. Uh, worked a lot of things, a lot of playoffs in baseball and pro baseball. I mean, we, you know, it was the same players that went to the big leagues. They just weren't quite as refined when you saw them and worked them. Um, so there were a lot of enjoyable, enjoyable times there. I think one football game that sticks out uh, as far as the high school level is uh, Fargo South played Bismarck Century in, at Bismarck. It was the best high school game I ever refereed. Um, Wentz was the quarterback for Century, and um, Fargo's quarterback also went to the NFL, I believe. I don't know that he hung on very long, but the game came down right to the end, and, I mean, there were just kids that you don't see very often all on the same field, and the temperature in the semi, it was a semifinal game, and it was like 75 degrees, so everyone was into the game, including the crowd. And it, though, games like that stick in my head, along with a lot of state finals are fun to work. Mm -hmm. um, worked a lot of them in basketball and football. Well, imagine, and, uh, imagine a state semifinal where it's 75 degrees. Yeah, that was totally out of the, out of the blue. And, and I'm always a guy that I can't, I don't like being cold. So after the first few games of the year, because of bugs or cold, I tell them long sleeves all the time. So I didn't even have a short sleeve shirt in my bag. So we wore long sleeves for that one. And I'm still trying to live it down. <laughs> oh, man. I was curious to one point that you were saying about how at one time you would get assignments by receiving phone calls from like coaches and ADs like, hey, are you free to come out to the school? When you get a call like that, were yep. you ever wondering like, boy, how'd it go the last time I was there? I guess they really liked how I did for their team or anything. Well, I didn't, I didn't think of it as they must have liked me. It was that I, I thought of it more from the other side as I must have not have been that bad. I, you know, I must not have screwed up anything too terribly. And, and we mellowed. I know coming off the baseball season, we'd come off the baseball season and go right into basketball. We have girls basketball and football in the fall. And when we were young, I mean, baseball was very adversarial at the time. And, you know, so you had to get after managers and get after players. And we'd come back here and the first couple times we didn't, really make the adjustment that well I'm talking Gary probably and I and we would snap at some coaches uh, but they coaches are a pretty forgiving group too and they look they look past a lot of things and uh, they allowed us to work on that and improve and we got better as it went we separated the baseball from high school and college sports that's interesting because but it was a process that's interesting because it's always like Boy, that coach is really hammering that rep. You guys kind of had it the other way. You thought, like, boy, I'm kind of really taking control maybe too much. Yeah, we were probably a little overbearing at times early, and it got better. And I, I always say, you know, you don't want coaches. Coaches can't hold a grudge, but neither can officials. And so when, when you have a part of, you know, Katie bar the door type stuff the first day, you know, like in baseball, we'd be going for a five game series sometimes. And if you had a tough day the first day, you go right back out there the next day, you look people in the eye and you start over from there. And if you take that philosophy with you into whether it's your job or, or an application like officiating, it will serve you well. Hard to believe that this would ever happen, but did you ever have to deal with people not liking your calls, and how so? Oh, of course. Uh, there were, uh, you get numerous reactions, um, and that's one of the hardest things. One thing I, I, I really tried to take care of business 
for the most part, there's always a few times, you know, you probably should have done more. But for the most part, I took care of business when it happened. And then as, as coaches and players realize that's what you're going to do, you have less and less of those incidents. They know if you draw lines for people, they will respect them most of the time. And you're still going to have some rubs, but overall, coaches, ath- people in athletics in general are very good people. And I, at clinics, I have said uh, many times, I can count, I've probably worked in, I don't know, 35, 40 states in the country, all kinds of levels of sports and different sports. And I can count the assholes on one hand. I said, there's really pretty good people involved. And officiating is just part of the experience. I mean, you, they can't play without officials. And we can't, we don't have a job without athletes and coaches. So if everyone respects their own lines, things go pretty well. Yeah, it's good to hear, man. Of, of all the guys that you've refed basketball with, where does the crew of Jeff Risk, Guido, and Brian rank in terms of expertise? The Barley Prop Pop crew. Well, there's there's various levels. I, I've had the pleasure to work with a lot of really good officials throughout the years. Um, a lot of them in baseball and several in basketball. I mean, I don't really want to try to rate myself or others, but I mean, I had partners like uh, Greg Johnson. Worked a long time with him until his health didn't allow him to work. Worked a lot of games with Gary Cedarstrom until uh, he was heavily involved in baseball. And uh, Rod Skitlin was a partner for a while. Lance Schoenwald, when he was around. Um, and football, I had Jerry Eggert for a long time on a crew, Dennis Kunkel. Uh, so... There's all kinds of guys that are, you always say you cannot referee alone. So I'm very thankful for the partners I've had. And um, hopefully we, you know, a little bit of what I did rubbed off on them and vice versa. I'll give you, a, hopefully we, I'll give you another question ahead. here that you can continue to be diplomatic about. Who are the best athletes that played in games that you officiated? You already mentioned Wentz and the Fargo quarterback, but anyone else come to mind when it comes to playing? Well, in games I've worked, I, I'll give you a small story. We, we were in Glens Falls, New York, in the Eastern League, and it's kind of getting into the – it was just after the draft. Um, so we're in probably July, early July. And I'm out there, and this pitcher is throwing balls – curveballs and people are laid on them. And I, uh, you know, we don't talk much during the game, but I went in to the home plate umpire one time and I said, is this guy throwing a little better than usual? He goes, no, I just don't think they can see it very well. It's kind of, you know, dusk and whatever. Well, that was after the game, but that was Roger Clemens. And uh, he had just come up from, I think, Texas won the NCAA or got close that year and came to the Eastern League. And so uh, they had quite a pitching staff uh, at Bristol. They had um, Mike Brown, Clements, Oil Cam Boyd, uh, Damon, Wright. They had a slug of them that went to the big leagues. I'm getting a little foggy on some of the names, but, you know, we saw all the all the good players really that went to the big leagues during that time between spring training and your and or your leagues. So those are probably the best athletes I've been around. Yeah, it's pretty solid, um, Roger Clemens. You know. Yeah, and it. <laughs> I mean, you don't really realize at the time. You, when I got out of baseball, is when I realized how far I'd gone. Because when you start to come back and, and watch other games, they kind of look like they're in slow motion for a while. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, and like everything, you adjust back to it. But um, 
at the time you don't really realize you're just doing it every day and it, it becomes relative because everybody's pretty good but um, one another guy Don Mattingly was in the first game I worked in the South Atlantic League he played at Greensboro and he, he is the best guy I've ever seen at even with two strikes he attacked the ball and he very rarely hit a weak ground ball or a fly ball. Everything was really pretty much on the line. And even his outs were hard hit balls. So he was one of the more impressive hitters I grew up around. From the so There's one other. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Let me tell you one other deal. There's a, one, an interesting thing I saw in spring training. I was in the Twins camp one year and Tony Oliva had gotten on, he was getting on this kid about not being able to hit pitches on the outer half of the plate. And young kids snapped back at him. And something about, let me see you handle it. We're around the cage. And uh, Tony grabbed the bat, and he had to get out because his knees were so bad. I mean, and they were darn near touching each other when he, when he stood even in a batting stance. But he got in that cage, and he hit about 10 peas in a row. Flipped the bat, walked out, looked at the kid, and said, maybe now you'll listen. And that was, that was really a good example of how good those guys actually are that, are that were good hitters. From the perspective of a longtime ref, how impressive is it to you how, you know, Gene Steratore – how he refed NFL football and then D1 college basketball. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, that, that's uh, above and beyond a bit. Um, the one, one side of it is if you're accepted, you know, officiating is kind of a fraternity. And so if you're well-known in one area, you, you know, People will give you a chance if you want it. It's just a it's just a heavy load uh, to go, but that's it's very impressive that you can be that good at two sports. Usually they they say if some guys will are really their philosophy is you can only be good at one sport. Um, if you work more and more, then you become average at them all. I don't know. There's various levels of that, but um, anytime you're working two sports at a high level, it's it's quite an accomplishment. Talking about uh, fraternities and connections, how did you uh, first kind of get with like the Mondag Athletic Conference to eventually become commissioner? Well, I started refing in the league. I was probably still in college almost when I started working in the league, and there were, I grew up in Benford, which Red Willow Lake was kind of the area that we all congregated in, and all the sporting events took place there, all the dances, all, um, you know, just basic living <laughs> kind of went through Red Willow, and three people, Buster Gillis was from New Rockford, Terry Olson was from Lakota, and Dwayne Schwab was involved with Lakota when I was in school also, and then um, Devil's Lake St. Mary's. And all three of those people spent their whole career in the Mondac. And they were, they didn't have a commissioner for a long time. They didn't have an assigner. And they thought they needed to start going that route because they had some good arguments over who should officiate. And so I started out doing the assigning I did it for one year and the guy that was the commissioner he got out and so they said do you want to do both and it was really quite a unique situation where I refereed in the in the DAC and the North Star and the Mondac and assigned those leagues so that doesn't happen very often but it was uh it was an enjoyable situation for me because I told them I don't want to get out of officiating at the time. And they said, well, then you can referee. 
but it has been better since I retire, retired from officiating. I think the coaches are a little more open to kind of say their true opinions and things about what's going on rather when they know I'm not going to be coming to work their games anymore. So, but it's been, it's been very enjoyable. Okay. Um, you are at the center of a lot of different venues when you're officiating and you've seen just, uh, I don't know, the areas of different, you know, fan experiences and whatnot. What do you think is important when it comes for, to fans having a good time at these different events? Well, one, you have to have a good seat. I mean, you have to have good sight lines. The place has to be well lit. And I, I always compare places. I like arenas versus gyms. And um, if you have access, easy access to restroom facilities, concession stands, you're not waiting in line, missing games. And then I think the people have to create an atmosphere at the game. And a lot of that is your, your whoever is on your PA, who controls your music, who controls your video. Um, all that adds to the experience. And one thing that's kind of gotten lost in the shuffle is, is it used to be bands all the time when you went. And you really notice it now when you go and there's a good band playing at, at an event. Um, and that it, it's sad, kind of, that that's gone from the norm to the rarity. But I think all those work together to make it an enjoyable experience. All right. So another stop that you had recently, a couple couple years back ish, um, you were eighty a little bit at Nedros. That was a starting up program, basically. Uh, what was kind of the challenges there of getting them going, and what do you think of the direction that they're going? Because I mean, their teams are starting to get more. Competitive. They don't feel like in like expansion teams really anymore. What do you think of that? Yeah, it was. I mean, the the hard thing at Nedros one is you had to get out in front of things a little bit with the planning because I talked to many people down through the years and they go, "I wish we'd have done this. I wish we'd have done that." Because now we're stuck with it for fifty years. So the planning portion of it was was really big. And, and Chuck Miller did a nice job with that as far as allowing um, good facilities to be built. We did run into a little snag. We were supposed to have that field. It was supposed to be turf. And then we built during the oil, and we, the money was a little short, so mm -hmm. we lost that. So, But facilities is a, is a really key thing. And then at the startup, you know, most most times you go to an AD job and most things are established. At Nedros, nothing was. <laughs> Had to order all the, we ordered all the equipment, all the stuff for the weight room, all the stuff for what everything involved. And then no one at the involved in the district knew anything about running a clock, lining a field maintaining the field, you know, all those things. So you had to find people and teach them, you know, how to, how to do things. And so I knew that the work up front would be kind of laborious and there'd be quite a bit, but uh, I've watched a lot of schools do things kind of half-assed their whole time. And I didn't want it to be a place like that. And so they've gotten going well, and I, I think they're, I haven't really been involved that much with uh, the stuff at Nedros anymore, but I think Brock's doing a nice job uh, bringing them along. I think the boys' programs are consistently improving. Uh, the girls' side has a little ways to go, but um, it's moving in the right direction. And the big thing, it's, it's opportunity for kids where I, I, I really wish mine had, had two high schools. Should have a long time ago. I think they made really poor decisions. And if you don't have any competition within, then kids find mischief. They drop out early. They, you know, in, drop out of sports early. And 
we lose out on a lot of things that are really pretty enjoyable for them. Yeah, absolutely, man. I can definitely feel like the importance of prep sports or whether like they're the kids or the coaches that care a lot about the kids, man. So throughout all your experiences, I mean, do you have like a friend group that you've been with like since the beginning of your uh, sports experiences that you guys have been tight for a very long time? And when you, is there anybody that you know, like not from sports at this point, because you've been in it for so long, you know? Well, there's, you know, when I came to Minot State, it's kind of funny, too, because Minot High School played uh, 48s in a state final. They ended up losing it in some overtimes. They blew a big lead in a short period of time at the end. And I remember watching the game, and I was pulling for Yates, you know, trying to, hoping they'd, you know, I'd like to see comebacks in sports and whatever. So that happened, and then I came to Minot, to go to school, and some of my early friends were Mark Luther, Gary Cedarstrom, and Mike Elgey, who all played in that game. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it, that was really ironic, and I mean that is still still the case. We work football together, we work basketball, a lot of things together, and and do a lot of things, you know, off the field together also, and kind of weird. Mike lives about three, four houses down from me on the same block. Um, and so, so that's kind of a core, probably early core thing. And then that Greg Johnson was playing basketball at the time. And then when he finished, you know, you met him. Um, a lot of people, and they they were all sick Taz also, along with you know, Randy Edburn, who we keep in touch with um, quite a bit, who's really been successful getting his quarterbacks to the NFL. And those are all college friendships that you made and and still, you know, extend to this day. Sweet, man. Uh, yeah, just you need so many people in something like this. And uh, it sounds like it's been an awesome experience for you from the beginning here. I wanted to get you out on one other lighter question. I got to see... You meet your wife at Andrew and McKenna Goodmanson's wedding a while back over at the Flicker Tail, and they know so many people as well through what they do with real estate and whatnot. It's maybe you can throw sports into there too. But, boy, that was like the most vast spread of food. They filled the entire indoor Flicker Tail building at the state fairgrounds. What was your favorite food out of that entire ceremony? Well, I did try them all. Mm -hmm, of course. Was, to um, get a proper assessment. Yeah, you know, I'm not shy when it comes to to eating, but I I don't know where they were catered from or wherever. But whatever the shrimp, I thought they were probably the best of of all the things they had. Um, so I ate my helping of that, and probably yours and my wife's also. Now, were they like fritters or no? What's a fritter? Well, when they're like fried up. <laughs> oh. No, they were more steamed, I believe, and that's all how I eat a lot. I eat a lot of stuff, a lot of white fish dumped in butter. Was the shrimp strong? <laughs> was the shrimp strong enough on its own, or did you need the cocktail sauce to put it over the edge? Well, I'm I'm a little bit on the side where cocktail sauce kind of wrecks the flavor of the food you're eating. Agreed. That's why I think butter enhances it and probably a little salt. That's what we all say. I mean, no matter what seafood you have, it just gives you that great of an excuse to have a ton more butter, right? Yeah. I. That's what I get. A lot of times I go to Vegas a lot, and my, my appetizer is always shrimp cocktail, but with melted butter. Fantastic. You then can you, can just work it off it, you can work it off running up and down the basketball court reffing, right? Yeah, you used to. And I had to make an adjustment when I, when I quit. I had to cut back on the consumption a little bit because my bones were going up. And I'm a short guy, <laughs> so I got nowhere to put it. Me too, man. So um, one more thing I did think about, I remember when you were wrapping up your repping career, they had you stand like right in the middle of the court at the Maya Auditorium, like 
it was just your stage, man. Like they just rattled off like all the contributions that you did over the years. How did that sort of make you feel? And did it make the time maybe seem like it went by really fast given like what all you've done? You know, when you look at things, I mean, you when you look back at things, I told people you can't be a history major, but you have to glance back to see where you were and where you are now. Um, engage improvement a little there. And when you look back, when they were running some of those things off and you start to think back, it's kind of like yesterday that you were you were doing it in one respect, and then when you turn around the other way and look at it, it's like, well, oh, that was... I've been doing this a while. So, but it's, it's rewarding right? to, to work a lot of things like that out of Minot, North Dakota um, was was really enjoyable. Minot is a great place for, it was a great place for like high school basketball went back when I started because there were so many schools in the area. It was a tougher place to work college basketball, but they allowed me to do that anyway. And then, like, getting in the North Central Conference was almost unheard of if you lived out here. And so things like that were, I really was allowed to have some good experiences and not have to relocate. Awesome, man. Well, hey, it's been great getting to know you uh, around here, obviously, Jeff. And I'm sure everybody's really grateful for what you've done for sports around here in the Mondack League. So I appreciate you taking some time out today to uh, just go over all these experiences, man. And uh, I guess we'll wish you the best and uh, see you the next time around. Thanks. All righty. Thanks a lot, Ben.